الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم بالشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيد ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله قصله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة فكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله ولو آمن أهل الكتاب لكان خيرا لهم منهم المؤمنون وأكثرهم الفاسقون لن يضروكم إلا أذى وإن يقاتلوكم يولوكم الأدبار ثم لا ينصرون رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لسان يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين Today I want to complete the brief comments I wanted to make about uh, the concept of commanding good and forbidding evil. And the ayat of reference today are, uh, again, 110 and maybe a little bit of 111 of Surah Ali Imran. Uh, this passage actually in the Quran, it's, that's, that's towards the end of this passage, is actually probably the most comprehensive passage on the subject of commanding good and forbidding evil. That theme and that concept is reiterated over and over again, and it's echoed over and over again in this passage. But anyway, in, in previous khutbahs, I've talked to you folks about um, the mannerisms of commanding good and forbidding evil. I've talked to you about how somebody could actually think that they're doing so, but actually serving their own ego. We also talked a little bit about what is it that we command to, and how if there are things that are smaller and that, that are, we don't even understand the technicalities of them. The average Muslim may not be qualified to know the technical details of, you know, uh, of fiqh and things like that. That's not what, they, they don't take their opinion and that impose that on everybody else and say this is commanding and good, commanding the good and forbidding evil. But rather it's about values. And there are certain values that are timeless in our religion. They have been there, they've always been there, they're always going to be there. And these are some of the values that were given even to the people before us. So it's not just us who has them. They were given to the people before us and then they were reinforced and confirmed with what Allah gave to us. So it's actually a continuous thing that started much before us and is carried on with us. This is why it's called Millata Abikum Ibrahim, the religion of your father, Ibrahim. Now, last time I talked to you about commanding good and I wanted to actually take some time to, to talk about the word commanding, Amr. Um, and then even, we talked about ma'roof before, but today I want to talk about Amr and then I want to switch over to the side where Allah talks about forbidding evil. So the first thing I want to bring up to, about the, the concept of Amr in Arabic is that it's actually not just a command. It's interestingly enough, in, the, in ancient poetry and other references, the word, the same word was used when you tell somebody to do something, which is a command, also used when you advise someone to do something, which is totally different from a command. When you command someone, you come from a position of authority. When you advise someone, you may even be requesting them, you may be counseling them, you, you, you don't come top down. You're actually on the same footing, you understand? So in life, there are some people that are under our authority. There are, for example, our children are under our authority, for example, right? 
And those I can, at, until a certain age at least, I can command them to do certain things. I can instruct them. But then there are others in life, friends, other family members, etc., where we're no longer in a position to command, or we never were. All we can do is what? All we can do is advise, right? And so it's important to understand that because sometimes what we don't get is that since Allah said command, we can take an authoritative tone with whoever we talk to and start talking to them about, well, Allah says this and you better, you know, and start coming down with a hammer and not having understood that there's every, every situation has a place. And what's remarkable in the Quran is that even the people we have authority over, for example, a father has authority over his son and he can tell his son what to do. And what you find in the Quran is the example of Luqman radiallahu anhu giving advice to his son. But instead of telling him what to do, he first starts with Ya Bunayya and then says La Tushrik Billah. He said, my beloved son, my little son, in other words, he used the term of endearment. First, you, ex you soften the heart by expressing the love that you have. And it also tells you the advice that's about to be given is not coming from a place of anger or frustration, or it's not coming from a negative emotion. It's actually rooted in love. It's because I love you that I wanted to tell you this. And then he says something so serious. He says, La tushrik billah. Don't do shirk with Allah. Right? And it's important that you understand the flip side of that too, because human beings by nature are defensive. If I went to somebody and said, hey, I love you, don't do shirk. What would they do? Excuse me? You think I do shirk? You think I got a Aqidah problem? You don't think I believe in Allah? Or even a son could turn to his father and say, thanks a lot, dad. Obvious. I didn't go to Sunday school. Don't do shirk. Yeah, that's deep wisdom, father. You see, you can dismiss good advice and not understand where it's coming from. And perhaps, you know, you know, for example, even just thinking about shirk for a moment, even though we're not discussing those ayat, it's very easy to understand that shirk isn't just the worship of idols. Shirk can take many forms. It can be like the Prophet ﷺ described, like a blank, black ant on a dark night, on a rock, on a black rock. You can't see it. The shirk can creep into your thought process in many different ways. And because Allah has so many names, right? Allah has, and each one of those names of Allah has an effect on the relationship I have with Allah. I can actually do shirk with any one of those names, for example. I could do that. And to give you an example of that, uh, uh, Allah's name is the one in control, right? The one in complete control. And sometimes I can make decisions in life absent of the thought that Allah is the one actually in charge. And I think I can cross Allah's lines and follow other rules or take, make other plans that is, that are, that's going to get me where I want to get, assuming that Allah has nothing to say about that or do about that. Right? So in, in that moment, I don't actually hold the view in my heart that in Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. I don't hold that view. So, you know, and similarly, when you start, when you and I start feeling entitled, when you and I start feeling like we deserve, we deserve, we deserve, like even something small, like you open up your fridge and your favorite drink isn't there. Come on, right? For that moment, when it's not there, we forget that there are so many who don't even have clean drinking water. We don't, we forget that. But more importantly, whatever we do have inside that fridge, that's actually a gift given from Allah. Because he's a wahhab he's a razak, he's the provider. So in those moments, we can actually start thinking, losing sight of a name of Allah or the other, a relationship we have Allah with Allah or the other. He's telling his son, be mindful of Allah in everything that you do. He's not just saying, don't bow down to idols, you understand? In other words, the son would have to engage in some thought to appreciate what's being said. What I'm coming back to then is when you advise, there's two bits of ironically advice. The advice to the one giving and advice to the one receiving. The advice to the one giving is don't jump the gun and assume I know what you're going to say, okay? I already know what you're going to say. Thanks. Thanks for your advice. You already put up a wall and you don't want to hear what's being said and you don't want to think about it because you assume that the person's coming from a place of judgment, not a place of love, not a place of sincere advice. For the advisor, for the one who's going to share some advice, a few bits of advice for them, are first and foremost, you should know who you're talking to. 
I mean, most of the time, we're not going to go give advice to strangers. You're going to talk to your sister, your brother, your cousin, your uncle, your, your, your husband, your wife, your mother, your father. These are people you've spent lifetimes with. These are people that you live with. These are people you know and you understand. And you've had, that's the truth of it, you've had a million arguments with them. You've had a lot of conversations that started normal and then they fell off a cliff. You had those conversations already. You're smart enough to know that if I say it in this way, it's going to lead to something really bad. Because you can almost, you can, many of you can actually play out the entire conversation in your head before having the conversation. So think a little carefully and say, what can I say that doesn't lead down that road? I still want to say this advice, but maybe I want to cushion this advice or capture this advice with love, with care, with concern, Ya and then give that advice. You know, go back to this, this ayah again that I'm trying to share with you. You are the best of all nations brought out for the benefit of humanity. Linnas, for people. We start thinking this ayah is only about da'wah to non-Muslims. You can't talk about da'wah to non-Muslims and sharing the message of Islam with others. Well, we're not even good at sharing basic advice with each other. You, that's, the, that's the next step. But when somebody comes into this, oh, well, Islam is the best. You know, I don't see you guys being the best to each other. How is this the best? You're only the best in brochures? You're only the best in like da'wah videos? That's, that's where you're the best? How are you the best in the way you talk to each other? How are you the, be the best in the way you advise each other? So that's part of what I wanted to highlight in ta'muruna bil ma'roof, that you give advice to something. And by the way, it's remarkable that al-ma'roof is being used. And al-ma'roof, one of the meanings of the word al-ma'roof, in addition to what I already shared with you before, is that which is known. Advising to that which is known. Now that's interesting because if it's already known, why do you have to advise it? Why do you have to tell someone? Because they should already what? No. That's actually a fundamental principle of our religion. Because fadakir, remind. You can't remind someone of something they didn't know. You can only remind someone of something they already knew. You can teach someone something new. You can inform someone of something new. But the, the, the word reminder is actually rooted in the idea that you already knew it, but you lost sight of it. You became a little, you, you ignored it a little. You know, you, you didn't realize it at the time. Or it left your conscience. So it's being refreshed for you. The entire Quran is called reminder. Think about the, just the word reminder, what that would mean. That means that just because someone's telling you something you've heard before, or I've heard before, my attitude is not, man, I already heard this. I don't need this from you. I already know this. Uh, you know it here. But sometimes we need to know it all over again over here. We need to see it. We, we heard it before, but our eyes get rusty. Our hearts get rusty. And when you're reminded, the dust comes off. And so, ta'muruna bil ma'roof, you advise to good. Now the religion is perfect. And the religion is beautiful. And the word of Allah and the teachings of our Prophet ﷺ are, are priceless and without flaw. But the way we share it can have plenty of flaws, you understand? And the way we receive it can have plenty of flaws. And both the sharer and the receiver have to understand that they're dealing with something more sacred than each other's egos. They have to put themselves aside. The The word of Allah is supreme. The worst case scenario of this, I'll share with you, is sometimes somebody misuses an ayah or misuses a hadith to correct you. Right? So they're, they're, it's sacred. It's the word of Allah. It's the, it's the authentic words of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but they they misused it, and you know better already. You know that they're misusing it, yeah. And they use that to do some amr bil ma'roof and nahi al munkar smackdown on you, right? That's what they're that's what they're doing. Now you have an opportunity to say, you know what? You're misusing this hadith. You're misusing this ayah. And you know what? This is what it actually means. So you need to check your place. If somebody wants to, you know, and the devil can come to any of you and, and myself. In the middle of such a conversation. If somebody tries to come and tell me, you know what Allah says? I could go in my head and say, you know what? I got a lot of YouTube videos. I can Quran you right now too. You want to go, you want to Islam me? I could Islam you right back, bro. I'm pretty good at Islaming back. But this isn't a ping pong match. This isn't you smacked it harder, I'm going to smack it back harder. Because now what are you doing? You're using the word of Allah. Oh, you use this one? I'm going to use that one. And then he says, oh yeah, you want to use that one? I'm going to use this one. And now 
you are actually using the word of Allah to further your own ego. It's just a thing to use to win an argument. You understand? So who's higher now? Is the word of Allah higher? Or is my need to win an argument higher? Isn't that a scary thing? Isn't that a crime against Allah's word? When Allah says the word of Allah is in the highest place? So when such a situation happens and somebody misuses a hadith, misuses an ayah, and slaps it on your face, what are you and I supposed to do? You, all we see at that time is someone being obnoxious and arrogant and abusive and ignorant actually. Right? That's all you see at the moment. But as a slave of Allah, what do you and I need to see? We need to see that what came out of their mouth is the word of Allah. And I am having, I'm not having an argument with the word of Allah. I'm having an argument with this person, you understand? So right now, because they chose to use the word of Allah, I'm just going to become quiet. I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to correct it right now, because I'm not talking to someone who wants to reason. I want, I'm talking to someone who wants to win. And there's no reason to, to disregard or do, do a disservice to the Qur'an, to the words of the Prophet ﷺ, by bringing, using that in this conversation, or allowing them to continue to use it in this conversation. I won't do it. I will not do it. I will leave the word of Allah right now out of it. This is part of that murunam al-maruf, by the way. You have to stop yourself from doing something, what you think is good. Oh, no, no, I want to correct them right now. No. That's not the time to correct them. You should know better. You should know the people you're arguing with. If you correct them, what are they going to do? Oh, thank you for this correction. I never understood the tafsir of this ayah in this way. Ah, finally I understand. Jazakallah khairan. You win. That's what your mom's going to do? That's what your brother's going to do? That's what your uncle's going to do? They're, they're going to turn around and come back even harder, isn't it? You should know that you're paving the, the way, if they said one thing that's out of line, now you're paving the way for them to say even worse. And the angels are recording all of it. So you have to learn to diffuse the situation and say, you just, just that's, you can't even say, by the way, what you said is misuse and I heard a khutbah and I'm not going to say anything because I'm so humble. That's not humility. That's got to be just in your, <laughs> I gotta, I'm going to humble myself before Allah. I won't say anything. And you know what that person might think? Here's the fun part. The person you were silent to now, they'll say, I got him good. Man, I dropped that ayah on him, I dropped that hadith, and he was like, ha, quiet. Yep, he got Islamed good. And then they'll go to tell their friend, you know what? He was arguing with me, and I told him this hadith, or I told her this ayah, and she was quiet after that. Shh. What'd she say? Nothing. What's she gonna say? What's she gonna say after that? <laughs> And in your head, because you were quiet, you're like, I can't let him have those points, this victory. They're going to go back and report it to others. They're going to tell everybody else they won this one. You might have to lose some of them to gain your humility back with Allah. Part of Amr bin Ma'roof is understanding that Allah is the one giving us this charge. That we don't use the word of Allah in this way. And this is why I advise over and over again, I don't get tired of saying it. That if you are having a personal disagreement with someone and the conversation is getting heated, don't bring Islam into it. Don't bring the sacred word into it. You can talk about it later. You can bring the words of the Prophet ﷺ or Allah Azza wa Jalla later. Why? Because in the moment, if you say, you know what, that hadith, you know what it says about people like you? You know what Allah says about that? What you just said? You know what Allah says about that? I'm very capable of doing that in an argument. You too. You've, been, you've heard enough lectures, you've read enough books. You can quote something from the Prophet ﷺ. You know, the Prophet ﷺ would never do what you're doing right now. Because you know what he did? Now the other person would say, Oh yeah, he wouldn't do what I'm doing. What about what you're doing? What about this hadith? Well, uh, this is again, drifting away. And in their head, you know what the, the crazy thing is? When people do this ugly behavior, what's in their head? I just commanded the good and forbid, forbade the evil. This is evil in and of itself. We don't play with the religion like that. Why? What are, the, what are the consequences of playing with a religion like that? You know what it does? Over time, people, originally a person resented you because the, you were arguing with them. But because you kept on using the religion, they no longer just resent you. They resent the religion. And so every time Allah's word is brought up, they get flashbacks of how they were slapped. And in the middle of those slaps, they heard Allah's words. So they are now dismissive and defensive against any words that come from Allah because it just reminds them of the arguments they had with you and me. 
And so we practically took someone's heart away from the word of Allah. What a crime that is. What a crime that is. They, we gave them this, you know, a trigger that the Quran now becomes a trigger for them. When they hear ayat about parents, when they hear ayat about inheritance, when they hear ayat about whatever, husband and wife, they get triggered. Like, I want to hear this. Oh, I know how these people use that. Because they, they remember those arguments. And this is why, you know, one of the, one of the tricks of shaitan is زَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانَ عَمَالَهُمْ Shaitan beautifies their deeds for them. In other words, they think they're doing something good while they're doing the devil's bidding. And that's what I wanted to warn myself and all of you about when it comes to ta'buruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna anil munkar. Then lastly, in, in, yeah, I know I've taken quite a bit of time, but wa tanhawna anil munkar, you forbid evil. And forbidding is actually not advising. It's actually, you know how I said commanding is a range, you can advise all the way to command, depending on the situation, right? But when it came to the word for forbidding, it's not oh, advising against. No, it's forbidding. It's putting a stop to it. This is not going to stand. And munkar is something not recognized by the soul, actually. I'm, I'm summarizing a lot of discourse behind the word munkar. Ankara is to deny. And Allah put goodness inside of our nature. So one of the words for evil is evil is not something put in our nature. So the inside goodness of a human being rejects it. And that which is rejected and un unrecognized as good is called therefore munkar. So it's, you know that it's a value that's evil, that's wrong. And when something is evil and wrong, you don't have to be politically correct about it. You just got to say that's evil. That's wrong. I know hearing that it's wrong hurts your feelings, but it's still wrong. You might feel like I'm judging you. I'm not judging you. you this act is judged not by me, but by Allah. Your judgment is with Allah. I can't judge you. You can't judge me. But the wrong that is actually wrong, that is actually evil, will never be bent to make you feel better. You, you, you can't bend that. You can still speak in loving ways. But just because you speak nicely, doesn't mean you bend the truth. And that's an interesting trick of shaitan. Sometimes we're put in a corner and we're made to ask, we're asked a question that maybe the answer to it is politically incorrect. But it's not something people want to hear. Because there's a narrative in society in which that answer is not acceptable. What is Islam's stance on homosexuality? It's a complicated question, but at the base of it, it's not complicated at all. Allah stands against it. There's no ambiguity in the Quran about it. There's no ambiguity in the Prophet's teachings about it, sallallahu alayhi wa It's been called it a fahisha, something disgraceful. That's what he calls it, something shameless. I didn't choose those words. He did. Now, in order to protect someone's feelings, I say, but I'm not judging you. But I didn't, I wasn't asked to judge you. I was asked to, I was asked, what does Allah say about this? What does he have to say about this? This is what he says. Are you committing a shameless act? Are you committing an act of indecency? That's what he said. So whether it comes to this issue or any other issue, somebody will get offended. The truth is, someone will get offended. But you can't not say if you're asked, is this an evil in Islam? Is this considered acceptable in Islam? No, it's not. What do you... What do you mean it's not acceptable? Do you hate all those people? Do you want to kill all those people? That's not what I said. I just said that's, a, that's unacceptable. No, I don't want you to feel bad. Maybe, there's a, maybe I can find a difference of opinion for you so you could feel better. No, in some things there is no difference of opinion. Facts are facts. Can't mess, that, those are, they're coming from Allah. Tell them the truth comes from your master. Whoever wants, they can, just, they can believe it. Whoever wants, they should disbelieve. Allah is not going to compromise what He says. I cannot speak. I started this khutbah. I cannot speak from a position of authority. Right? But Allah speaks to His slaves from a position of authority. And I don't have a right to be nice to someone and mess with His authority. And then His words so you can feel better about yourself. So you don't have to feel judged. Well, I can't judge you, but Allah certainly can. And that's up to you. If you're asking, that doesn't mean I go around slapping people with ayat and say, you know what? You know what, what this is? 
again, coming back to what, how Amr works. There are values that we will always stand by. Doesn't matter if it's politically correct or not. Doesn't matter if it's acceptable to somebody else or not. And in a world where people carry all kinds of values, all kinds of crazy values, and then they expect everyone else to glorify them, then if they have no shame in glorifying whatever values they want, why are you and I so ashamed to glorify the values Allah has given us? Why? Everybody has a right to be however they want, except us. This is one thing that I felt, you know, the first time I, uh, uh, you know, this, I don't consider the Kufi a part of, you know, a, a mandate in the religion. There's a study behind it, Dr. Akhtar has got a study on but I, I will tell you a story. When I first became serious about my religion, I couldn't even grow a beard, but I felt like this is how I can show everybody that I'm Muslim. Right, I put this thing on, I'm getting on the subway in New York City, and I, I, first time I was shaking in the inside, like, and somebody, somebody bumped into me and said, excuse me, Muhammad. And I was like, Ugh. you know, but it was a nerve wracking thing that you visibly look Muslim, you know, and because it's a symbol, right? But when I did that, but before I did that, you know what it was? When you go into a subway, I don't know how it is nowadays, because ain't nobody going to subways now, it's, you know, quarantined. But when you were going, to, you see people with all kinds of stuff, man. You see rings, not those rings in places I didn't know you could put rings. Tattoos where I don't know where the face ends and the tattoo begins. I mean, people are in all colors and shapes and sizes. People do with their hair, people do with their bodies, what you would not imagine. And none of they're proud of it. Freedom of expression, right? They were with pride. They could dress however they want with pride. And I'm like, and I'm so ashamed to identify myself, to visibly look Muslim. And they have no hesitation in being however they are. And that they're doing that to make themselves, they're proud of themselves. And I'm not proud of my religion. I'm not proud of my prophet. I'm not proud of the word of Allah. I'm hesitating. Why don't, they should be the one having hesitation on me. Ayyul Fariqaini Ahakku Bil Amn. Ibrahim Ali Salam asked the question, which of the two groups should feel more at ease? Which should, should feel peace? Who should be more comfortable with themselves? <laughs> Carrying themselves a certain way. So, the thing is, when it comes to our values, you have to become comfortable with them. When it comes to the word of Allah, you have to become comfortable with it. And so I, I end this khutbah, this long khutbah, with the following, the, the, the conclusion of this ayah. وَلَوْ آمَنَ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ Had the people of the book actually believed it would have been better for them. What? This ayah wasn't about believing and disbelieving. This is the same ayah. It was about commanding the good and forbidding the evil. And Allah says, had they believed, it would have been better for them. Why? Because they abandoned this principle. They started changing the good and the evil to their liking. They, started, they stopped speaking out against certain evils. They started becoming more accepting of other kinds of sins. It's okay. It's all right. I don't want you. I want you to feel accepted in the because by the way, making someone feel accepted sounds like a really good thing, and it is a good thing. We accept all human beings, but we don't accept evil itself. And even if someone is engaged in evil, accepting them, you know what that means? Let me help. Let me help. Under, let's understand where that came from. What did you go through that spiraled you down? Let help. Let's help you heal. Let's do that. But you know what that what the new acceptance is? Acceptance is you can do whatever you know evil that Allah says not to do. But I want to accept you, so I still want to give you a hug and not talk about what you're doing wrong because you might feel bad. And I don't want to address what's actually happened. I'm saying going to the go to the treat people like people. Nobody starts drinking because they just want to do haram one day. They went through a bad divorce, or they got they lost their job, or they got diagnosed with a disease, or something happened to them, and they decided one day that they just need to check out, and they went to, in the wrong direction. But they're going through a lot emotionally before they went down that road. Isn't that true? So when we, if you want to help someone and accept them, first understand their pain. Understand what hurt them. Understand that they need someone that cares for them, which is why I started with when you enjoy good, first you demonstrate your love and your care. But even as you care for them, and they say, you think I'm a bad person because I drink? I'm, evil, I'm going to hell because I drink, right? How should I answer that? I'm evil because I drink, right? 
I'm evil because I, I do I do zina, right? I'm evil because I do drugs, right? No, you're not evil, but what the, what you're doing is evil. That's just the truth. It is. You should get away from it. It is harmful for you. And I can't tell you otherwise. It is wrong, but you shouldn't lose hope in Allah's mercy. You should try to find your way out of that darkness. The fact that you even say that yourself, that you're doing that, and it's not something that's good for you. I didn't say that, you said that. So there's something in you that already recognizes that it's a problem. And I'm, I'm, Allah has given every one of us the strength to come out of darkness and He can bring us into light. He can do that. So let's find a way. You'll get out of this. I know you will. Any human being who makes the intention to come out of darkness, Allah will not leave them abandoned. Why is that such a hard conversation to have? Instead of saying, you know, I'm going to hell because I drink. No, Allah understands. No, that's the wrong thing to say. Allah understands. It's okay. Keep drink. No, 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 no. Allah understands your pain. Allah understands how you can slip. Allah understands that you can make mistakes. Every child of Adam makes mistakes. But the point is you must recognize your mistake and find your way back. That's the real conversation. So that's part of commanding the good and forbidding the evil and being accepting of people because what people have tried to do now is to say that if you say the right thing, you're being judgmental, you're not being compassionate, you're not being understanding, you're not being merciful, Islam is merciful, be merciful. Yeah, you should be merciful and still stand by the truth. You don't pick one or the other. Our religion is both of those things. Some people want to be the, just be the flag bearers for the truth while being ruthless. And the others want to be merciful by letting go of the truth. We don't get to pick between those two. May Allah Azza wa Jal truly make us an ummah of commanding good and forbidding evil and not allow us to fall into the traps that the people before us fell into. And if we have fallen into them, that Allah Azza wa Jal give us the commitment to His light that we come out of them. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إن كحميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون قم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتاب موقوتا الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا للصلاة حيا للفلاح فذا قامت الصلاة فذا قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغبوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله ولو آمن أهل الكتاب لكان خيرا لهم منهم المؤمنون وأكثرهم الفاسقون الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين 
إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين دين الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين وقل الحق من ربكم فمن شاء فليؤمن ومن شاء فليكفر إنا أعتدنا للظالمين نارا أحاط بهم سرادقها وإن يستغيثوا يغاثوا بماء كالمهل يشوي الوجوه بئس الشراب وساءت مرتفقا إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات إنا لا نضيع أجر من أحسن عملا الله أكبر سميع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله الذي لا اله الا الله سبحان الله الحمد لله لا اله الا الله اللهم انت السلام لك السلام حتى تعالى مشتاق لك رحمه الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على نبينا محمد